Today we're talking about the Confederate statues and memorials that are scattered across the country. Are these important cultural icons, daily reminders of an ongoing struggle for equality, or just artifacts that preserve our collective history? Heritage or hate? Asks the headline. I initially expected that any answer I might find would be complex, to say the least, if I could find one at all. I forgot that this channel is as much about questions as it is about answers. And I was wrong. Heritage or hate turned out to be pretty simple. It's both. But why that's the wrong question takes some explanation. I want to get right to it, but two quick things. One, maybe grab a snack. This is going to be a longer video. And two, I don't know how to warn you about what's coming, because I don't know who you are, what you know, what you believe, and how sure you are about the difference between those things. Let me just say that I'm not the same person I was when I started researching this. It's a heavy topic. Everything else I want to say to warn you either seems like too much or not enough. So let's get into it. Today, I'm asking, what's the story with all these monuments anyway? There's so much controversy around these at the moment, so let's be thorough. What's a monument? The word monument itself comes from the Latin root meaning to remind, to keep you from forgetting a thing. The monuments we're talking about today were put in place to remind us of the people, places, and events that were important to the Confederacy in the Civil War. So let's start there. What was the Confederacy? And what happened to it? I'm not going to spend the next six hours poring over old photographs and paintings to the sound of mournful violin music. If you want to dig into the Civil War itself, Ken Burns made an excellent documentary that's far better than anything I could ever accomplish with one guy and a cell phone. I would encourage anyone to go watch that documentary and learn more about the Civil War, but the Civil War was the end of the Confederacy, not the beginning. And while the forces that created the CSA were varied and complex, there's kind of one big one. I'll give you a hint. It rhymes with bravery, but it's definitely not that. It's important that we get this right, because why the Confederacy was formed and what it was formed to be are going to come up again. So let's start with some context. There's one incident that provides a good example of just how united the states were in the mid-1800s. This happened in 1856, five years before the start of the Civil War. Senator Charles Sumner was an abolitionist of the newly formed Republican Party and a senator from Massachusetts. He gave a boisterous speech over two days against slavery as an institution and implementing it in the new state of Kansas. Then there's Representative Preston Brooks, a Democrat who decided that Sumner had insulted his great home state of South Carolina, and also his cousin who wrote the bill Sumner was opposing. Outraged by Sumner's speech, Brooks was going to challenge Sumner to a duel, but that would have been, you know, fair. So on the advice of fellow Democrat Lawrence Kite, they concluded that Sumner was a scoundrel who didn't rate the honor of a duel, and instead elected to pursue an alternative strategy. Thus, on May 22nd, Brooks, Kite, and another Democrat from Virginia walked into the chambers of the U.S. Senate, waited until they were mostly empty, and approached Sumner, who was seated and writing at his desk. Brooks calmly told Sumner that he considered his speech to be libel, and he was going to punish Sumner for it. Then, before Sumner could even stand up, Brooks beat the ever-loving stuffing out of Sumner with a thick, gold-topped walking cane. You know, like a mace, but made of wood and fancy. Brooks kept wailing away at the seated Sumner until Sumner literally ripped his desk out of the floor to escape. Apparently, the desks were bolted down for some reason. He chased Sumner, who was blinded and choking from his own blood at this point, and didn't stop until his cane snapped and Sumner passed out. Just kidding. He didn't stop then either. Brooks held Sumner up and kept hitting him with the top part of the cane that still had the metal covering attached. Meanwhile, his friend Kite made sure that no one who was there intervened by brandishing his own cane. And a gun. Because surprise duels are even better when you're the only one who's armed. The reason this is an illustration of the political climate of the times, and not just an instance of some guy going berserk due to an overdeveloped sense of family honor, is because when his voters back home heard about the incident, they not only re-elected Brooks immediately, they sent him hundreds of replacement canes. A newspaper in Richmond, Virginia, later the capital of the Confederacy, stated, Good, good, very good. The abolitionists have been suffered to run too long without collars. They must be lashed into submission. While another went with, An effectual and classic caning, we are rejoiced. The only regret we feel is that Mr. Brooks did not employ a slave whip instead of a stick. And then the article went on to suggest other abolitionists which might need this kind of control. Southern Democrats even made rings out of the bits of the broken cane which they had retrieved from the Senate floor. 
They wore these on necklaces to show their support for the beating. As for that other shining example of good people who was there for the attack, Kite tried to choke another representative two years later for basically saying, dude, I'm not your slave, you can't tell me what to do. And in 1860, he gave a speech that pretty much nailed the general view of the US's southern states when he said, the anti-slavery party contends that slavery is wrong in itself, and the government is a consolidated national democracy. We of the South contend that slavery is right, and that this is a Confederate Republic of Sovereign States. After the outbreak of war, he joined the Confederacy, was a member of their government for a while, became an officer in the Confederate Army, and then got killed fighting for the Confederacy in 1864. As for Sumner, it took him the better part of three years to recover from the attack. He almost certainly suffered from a traumatic brain injury and PTSD. Outrage over the incident helped the fledgling Republican Party gain a following in the North, while citizens in the South accused Sumner of being a weakling who had faked his injuries. Sumner's attackers were both from South Carolina, and it was the citizens of South Carolina that literally cheered when they heard about the beatdown. So it's really no surprise that South Carolina was where the Confederacy and the Civil War were born. What you think started the Civil War really depends on how much you were lied to about the whole thing. And that's a function of when and where you grew up and went to school. You may have heard that the war was fought for economic reasons, tariffs, taxes, a cultural rift, states' rights, or simply because the bossy northern states invaded. To be fair, Lincoln wasn't exactly thrilled to navigate the whole slavery issue from the outset of the war. And the idea that the South fought due to an invasion is one of those truths that depends on perspective. But whether the North fought to preserve the Union or free the slaves, or why any particular Southern soldier picked up a rifle every day, doesn't change one central truth. The Confederate States of America were founded to uphold a racist ideology and defend the practice of slavery. Full stop. As a quick aside, let's get the whole states' rights thing out of the way first, because it's a convenient excuse. At the outset of the war, the southern states were upset that northern states weren't enforcing the Fugitive Slave Act, or part of Article 4 of the Constitution. And I can see why that might be, if not a moral grievance, at least a technical one. But if you claim you're fighting in a war because states have the rights to do whatever they want, the argument kind of gets shot full of holes when you're mad that states aren't following the Constitution. That argument is then sunk completely when the CSA turned around and mandated slavery for every state that joined the Confederacy. So basically, we're leaving because you don't follow the agreement, and then we're gonna go form a government where you have to follow this other agreement to join up. What was their plan if Georgia later decided to free all its slaves? Invade to stop them? Even if you buy the states' rights argument, what do you think it was the right to do besides hold slaves? In other words, it was the states' right to make sure a group of people living there couldn't have any, including the right to leave. Glossing over that hypocrisy, what about economic issues? Well, that's a really dehumanizing way to talk about your labor force, which sort of makes sense because their labor force were slaves. All right, so what about cultural differences? It's slavery. Everything was about slavery. The reason the southern states tried to leave the US and the whole point of forming the Confederate States of America was slavery. But don't take my word for it. In 1861, someone said secession was necessary because the North had elected a man to be president whose opinions and purposes were hostile to slavery. Yeah, but that's just like somebody's opinion, right? I mean, oh. Okay, well, what about someone who claimed that a foundational cornerstone of the Confederate government was the idea that slavery was the just and natural result of black people's inferiority? That's probably not fair, right? What history-revising, South-hating, liberal arts basket weaver came up with this? Oh. So, if you look at the entire text of the secession declarations by Georgia, Texas, Mississippi, and South Carolina, all of them together, they reference slaves 82 times. That's more than 1% of all the words they used total, which might not sound like a lot, but it's more than government, north. Union, Constitution, right or rights, are, a, it, and more than South, Confederate or Confederacy, and people combined. Back to that point about states bailing because of taxes or tariffs. Well, tariffs don't show up at all in these secession documents and tax shows up once. So that probably covers what the CSA was about, but what happened to them?
So you might have seen this one coming. It was the Civil War. It didn't go well, at least for the Confederacy. Again, I'm not diving too far into the Civil War itself, but there are a couple things that are going to come up later. One is, you know, who started the whole thing. The Civil War officially began at the Battle of Fort Sumter, located at the mouth of Charleston Harbor in, you guessed it, South Carolina. Fort Sumter was a U.S. naval base. When Lincoln took office in 1861, the Confederacy had already been formed. It had besieged the fort, and the fort was running out of supplies. There was some attempt at a peace treaty, but the U.S. didn't recognize the CSA, and therefore any treaty with them would be the same as legitimizing that government. In April, Lincoln sent a message to the governor of South Carolina that he would try to resupply the fort with non-military supplies and no additional men. Also, could they please not shoot at them while they did this? When the Confederate government got wind of this, they demanded that the fort surrender. The commander of the fort said, all right, I will surrender at this time if I don't get any new orders. He sent that message to the Confederate general, who said, not good enough, we're shooting in an hour, good luck. Then the South started shooting. This isn't opinion. Actually, there's really no argument over who shot first in the Civil War. Only one member of the Confederate government is said to have even objected to attacking the fort in the first place. Secretary of State Robert Toombs. At a planning session about the whole thing, he said, this will lose us every friend at the North. You will only strike a hornet's nest. Legions, now quiet, will swarm out and sting us to death. It is unnecessary, it puts us in the wrong, and it is fatal. You know, man, when you're right, you're right. What's more telling is how this whole event is described after the war. Here's this guy again, who after the war wrote that the South did shoot first, but they didn't start the war because it is not he who strikes the first blow or fires the first gun that inaugurates or begins the conflict. Nope, he said the fault is the first guy who renders force necessary. So they blame the North and or Lincoln. That's the same logic that's used by domestic abusers and the one that these guys all used when they went to war. So, you know, not the greatest company to be in. But I mention this because this way of thinking is important and it will come up again. The last thing from the Civil War that we need to address is this idea that Southern soldiers didn't fight for slavery. I've already noted that if that's the case, they absolutely fought for a side that super duper was fighting for slavery. But you can see where this argument comes from. Believing that the common soldier was just caught in the middle somehow is a belief that makes it more okay to focus on the good stuff, like bravery, honor, and loyalty. I was just following orders and all that. So it makes sense that people say stuff like, 98% of Texas Confederate soldiers never owned a slave and never fought to defend slavery in a bill which made April Texas Confederate Heritage and History Month, a bill which passed in 1999. But that's a lie, or at least an extremely dishonest, narrow view of kind of one fact. What is true is that only a bit more than 1 in 10 Confederate soldiers directly owned a slave, which is five times worse than the claim for those from Texas, but it's still a small percentage of the total. Well, the word directly is important there, because slaves were property in the South. If I said the majority of U.S. soldiers today don't own their own car, that might be true, but it doesn't mean they didn't grow up with one. The fact is, if you look at the first crop of soldiers who volunteered to fight for the CSA in 1861, 36% or so either owned a slave directly or lived with a family member who did. If you combine that 36% with the number of soldiers who lived with non-family members who owned slaves, chuck in another 10%. So 46% total. Almost one in two Confederate soldiers in 1861 lived in a household that owned slaves. Throughout the entire South, almost 25% of households owned slaves. This means that you were more likely to join up if you had a direct link to slavery. More than half of the officer corps owned slaves. And slavery was so central to the economy of the South that probably most soldiers rented a slave or did direct business with people who did. Which might be why some Confederate soldiers talk about supporting slavery in their journals. Okay, but this video is about monuments, right? So maybe those monuments aren't to commemorate the Confederate government or slave-owning soldiers, except sort of maybe on accident. Maybe they're to remind us all of the long and proud history of the Confederacy and its traditions and... Four years. Okay, um... Like, for context, the entire history of the Confederate States of America lasted roughly eight months longer than President Trump has currently been in office. In their defense, probably seemed like longer for them, too. Eventually, the Civil War ended, and so did the Confederacy. The world's last slave-holding utopia for white supremacists went the way of the dodo in April of 1865. So, why are we still talking about it?
if you'd rather see these more complex episodes as one 40 minute episode or three 15 minute episodes, two 20 minute, let me know in the comments. I would love to hear from my awesome viewers. I think this issue is pretty timely. So episode two of this series will be the next episode. As always, thanks so much for watching, subscribing, liking, making comments, all those things. Hope we'll see you back and uh, hope you're doing well. Take care.